Thank you, Carol. Uh, I, I need to begin with a long list of thank yous, actually. Um, it's, a, it's really a privilege to be here at the University of Toronto this semester. Um, I, I need to thank Sharon Gerstein, who I know is not here, able to be with us today for the general sponsorship of this visiting professorship. Um, also, Anna Sternches, director of the center, who is also unable to be with us today, but who extended the, the invitation. And then Carol Clark and Dean Don McLean of the Faculty of Music, who worked out the nitty gritty of my shared status between uh, the center and the Faculty of Music. So thank you for that. I have been very warmly welcomed to the center uh, by my colleagues Anna, Galina, Natasha, Saul, Doris, Yiftach, and to music by my colleagues Carol, Sherry, Sarah, Ellen, and Remy. I should also thank the many students I've been getting to know since I've been here uh, who have been very kind and especially the intrepid ones who signed up for a course with a professor they didn't know on a topic they didn't know. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, students from both Jewish studies and musicology. So. Uh, we're, we're, um, we're doing the interdisciplinary thing in real time, so thank you for that. Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, a piece, uh, Arnold Schoenberg's Survivor from Warsaw from 1947, a piece that many people know by reputation, but not, people don't hear all that often. In my opinion, this is a piece that irritated virtually every exposed nerve in post-war Europe. It's a 12-tone piece in three languages, English, German, and Hebrew, about the Holocaust. It's written, by an it's written for an American audience by an emigre Jewish composer whose oeuvre had been the Nazis' prime exemplar of degenerate music. This composer was both admired and reviled as, the, as a pioneer of the 12-tone method of composition, had emigrated to the United States and become an American citizen. Clocking in at about seven minutes, a survivor is too short to occupy either half of a concert and too fraught to easily share the bill with anything else. Anxieties about musical modernism, the formation of Holocaust memory and culpability, the coexistence of Jews and former Nazis, the dislocation of massive migration, and the ubiquitous presence of the occupying forces, particularly the Americans, are all magnified through the lens of a survivor from Warsaw in post-war Europe. For all of these reasons, the decision to program, perform, review, or otherwise write about a survivor was not taken casually. Its presence was always by design, and it was always designed to mean something. This is particularly important because Schoenberg did not return to Europe himself after the war, but his music did. After an absence of more than a decade, and for all the reasons cited above, the re-presence, this is a term that Phil Bowman uses, of his music was conspicuous and significant. It can be regarded as a kind of remigration. My approach to remigration differs from that which has typically, uh, which has typified remigration studies, particularly as a subset of the German field of Exilforschung, in which, as Bridget Cohen has noted, she will also be speaking here in a few weeks, FYI. Uh, she's noted there's been a tendency to focus on the physical return of individuals after the war to minimize the significance of works they may have produced in the United States and or lay claim to that repertoire as part of European national music histories. Instead, I'm interested in Schoenberg's non-corporeal return in the form of his music, foregrounding the significance of a work from his American period and tracing its European reception, not in order to assimilate a survivor into European nationalist narratives, but to call attention to the constructed nature of those narratives. The impetus for my interpretation of remigration comes from the work of several scholars. Marita Kraus has a concept of remigrating ideas that is particularly relevant. Here she's referring specifically to the agency and reception of literature that circulated in post-war Europe, created by immigrants who did not themselves physically return. Hans Mommsen emphasizes that remigration studies cannot make the mistake of holding the personal physical presence of the remigrant as the deciding factor. By these measures, remigration is not limited to and does not require the physical presence of the individual. And in that way, it connects well to Stephen Greenblatt's theory of cultural mobility, or the study of what happens to cultural products that travel through time and space 
to emerge and be enshrined in new contexts and configurations. What kinds of baggage did a survivor accrue along the way, and what kinds of cultural work was it doing? Both Krauss and Greenblatt acknowledge that meaning does not reside within the artwork, but is recreated anew in each context. The local acoustics of each context will determine how a survivor resonates there. That music circulates independently of the originating artist does not mean that human agency is not required, but that the agency is not necessarily that of the composer. This is particularly the case where music is concerned, since its mobility is far more dependent upon the physical presence of performers and media than the physical pre presence of a composer. This circulation in post-war Europe is facilitated primarily by radio and by the International New Music Festival circuit. This is a project that began as a footnote, like so many things do. Um, I wrote to the Arnold Schoenberg Center and I said, wow, I would really like to know how often the, the Survivor from Warsaw was performed in post-war Europe, 1948 to 1968. And they were like, yeah, that would be great to know. If you find <laughs> out, you should let us know. And I thought, wow, OK. So something that you know, I thought would take 15 minutes took several years. Um, but I went to the Schoenberg Center and looked through the records they had of the royalty payments to Schoenberg's widow. This was, you know, this is a very um, time-honored musicological trick to figure out where things are happening, is to follow the money. And the money it takes the form of following who pays to perform the work. Um, it also, uh, what that file also revealed was that, that the, um, the press, the publishers were not especially conscientious, conscientious about collecting the royalties. His widow spent a lot of time complaining, hello, I heard that the piece was performed in these places and I'm not getting any money, what is happening? So. Um, but I was able to recreate the trajectory through Europe uh, largely by tracking the, the payments. So it began in Paris. Uh, René Leibowitz, a notoriously unreliable interlocutor, um, gave the European premiere. Um, he thought it was the world premiere. There's a whole story to that. Um, but there's also precious little evidence that it ever happened. There's evidence that he planned for it, but it's, it's not entirely clear that it actually took place. Um, he was, a, 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 I suppose, a frenemy of Schoenberg. They had a conflicted relationship. Um, another advocate of Schoenberg's is responsible for several performances. Uh, the conductor Hermann Scherchen is responsible for the West German premiere at the Darmstadt New Music Festival in 1950, where it met considerable resistance, uh, not only from the audience, but from the performers who were tasked with playing it and singing it. He then gave several performances in Italy, and also took it to a new music festival in Vienna in 1951. This is where a woman named, whoops, a woman, a woman named Paulina Hall, who's a major player in the new music scene in Scandinavia, heard the piece and decided that they really needed to perform it in Oslo. Um, she recruited the German, uh, sorry, Jewish German conductor Heinz Freudenthal to conduct the Scandinavian premiere as part of another international new music festival, the ISCM, um, in a rare and early commemoration of the Norwegian Jews who perished in the Holocaust. In 1958, the East German conductor Herbert Kegel gave the premiere with his Leipzig radio ensemble. Uh, the presentation in East Germany was almost entirely desemitized, uh, presented as anti-fascism. Uh, and then incredibly, to me at least, took that piece to Poland to perform it at the Warsaw Autumn Festival the same year in a, a, a form of cultural diplomacy. Um, at the uh, this is the reception there is extremely positive and seems to um, take the form of a lot of uh, Polish critics assimilating Jewish pain to uh, for their own purposes. That's where an influential Czech music critic saw it performed and began agitating for a performance in what was then Czechoslovakia. And the Czech story is distinct because of the two performers who did this most often in the 60s and 70s, both people who performed the role of narrator in this piece were actual Holocaust survivors. And as far as I can tell, this is the only place that that has happened. So let's talk a little bit about the piece. Um, the plot of a survivor is not taken from a single historical event, despite what you may read. Um, the text, Schoenberg, uh, accumulates accounts he heard from people, uh, survivors of various experiences in Europe. 
He at this time is in Los Angeles. Uh, concentration camps, ghettos, ideas from his own imagination, he says, and what uh, Camille Crittenden describes as his own dramatic synthesis. The title, however, is deliberate and very specific. The survivor is not from Treblinka or Auschwitz. He is from Warsaw. And that association, at least for Schoenberg's American audiences, would have triggered an immediate response, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I don't need to tell this audience, but I will tell you because it's here. Uh, fighting began in earnest on the eve of Passover on the 19th of April, 1943. And against all odds, the resistance held German forces at bay for nearly a month before they were defeated. The uprising quickly became, it quickly achieved iconic status as the most famous of the 100 or so known instances in which there was Jewish resistance to the Germans in armed combat. Warsaw had that emblematic significance for Schoenberg, too. He wrote to Kurt List, the title will be a survivor from Warsaw because it was my inspiration and the geographical meaning includes the ghetto and all what happened there. All what happened there included the uprising. So I'm going to play this for you. As I said, it's, it's a short piece. Um, you'll hear the narration. Uh, the narration is in English. Schoenberg wrote it, so it's not idiomatic English, but it is certainly intelligible English. You will hear the occasional quotation of a, uh, a German um, soldier, and that will be in German. Um, I didn't post, I'm not going to post a translation for that, but it's, I think it's pretty evident what he's saying. And then you'll reach a point where a male chorus will enter singing the Shema in Hebrew. So, um, so it's a piece for uh, narrator and orchestra and then male choir. Had been hit very hard. 
so hard that I couldn't help falling down. We all on the ground who couldn't stand up were then beaten over the head. must have been unconscious. The next thing I knew was a soldier saying, they are all dead. We have the sergeant ordered to do away with us. There I lay aside, half conscious. It had become very and pain. Then I heard the sergeant shouting, Abzell, next to the They started slowly and directly. One, two, three, four. Achtung! The sergeant shouted again, Rasch auf! Nochmal zum Vorland fangen! In einer Minute will ich wissen, wie viel ich zur Gaskammer abliefere. Erzählen! They began again. First slowly. One, two, three, four. We came faster and faster. So fast that it finally sounded like a stampede of wild horses. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, they began singing to the Shivani. Uh, that he cuts off the Shema here at the point of the text about rising up. And I think this is part of his connecting this experience to not just what happens at the Warsaw Ghetto, but about the uprising at the Warsaw Ghetto. So for the case study today, I thought we'd focus on the example of the 1951 Austrian premiere of a survivor in Vienna, Schoenberg's hometown, to which he said, I would like it best if performances of my music in Vienna were banned completely and forever. People have never treated me as badly as I was treated there. This was Schoenberg's response when the conductor Scherchen informed him that he was planning to perform a survivor in, war in Vienna and asked the composer for his blessing. Schoenberg had long had a love-hate relationship with his hometown. Just 16 months earlier, in October 1949, he had expressed delight at accepting the award of honorary citizenship in Vienna from that city's mayor, even while his correspondence with Viennese friends revealed a deep and abiding ambivalence. He had ample cause to proceed with caution. An organized anti-Semitic faction had torpedoed his academic career there in the first three decades of the century, and the press had regularly savaged his music as well as that of his students. 
Given that history and what he knew of the warm welcome Austria had offered the Third Reich in 1938, he was understandably wary of post-war rapprochement and had declined invitations to engage with the resuscitated Viennese new music scene. Nevertheless, on the 10th of April, 1951, Scherchen did conduct a survivor in Vienna on a concert for the Konzerthausgesellschaft's fourth international music fest. The first half showcased new 12-tone works. These are world premieres of um, Hauer, a piece by Hauer, um, Mario Perigallo's Piano Concerto, followed by the Austrian premiere of A Survivor from Warsaw. The narrator was the Viennese actor Albin Skoda, and he performed the role in German translation for the first and perhaps only time. After, after intermission, they performed Verdi's uh, Four Sacred Pieces, which is not an obvious lineup to me. I suspect this has to do with the fact that um, rehearsal time was short, they needed a choir, the choir had these pieces and their repertoire already. Fine, we can spend our time trying to learn the Schoenberg and then you guys can just sing the Verdi because you have it at hand. I, I can't understand how else it ends up on a new music concert. Um, Scherchen had not defied Schoenberg's wishes so much as he had softened him up. Uh, a letter from Schoenberg uh, in February of 1951, he says, I was not happy at first about giving my consent for the performance of a survivor in Vienna. Six minutes of music next to so many times that much space allotted to these other pieces. Uh, when Schoenberg wrote this letter, he was 76 years old in poor health living in California. He, he died about five months later. He was enjoying a measure of vindication in his twilight years, thanks to the prominence accorded his work in Europe since the end of the war, and he was reluctant to give the Viennese the satisfaction of using him as a pawn in their cultural politics, even as he fretted that his reputation warranted representation with a much longer work. So the context here uh, in Vienna, some things to bear in mind. Um, given the subject matter of a survivor and Schoenberg's multiplied identities, Jewish, Viennese by birth, culturally Germanic, he said often, American by citizenship. Austrian anti-Semitism has to be considered one of the most important residues coloring the, post, the composer's post-war remigration and Vienna's reception of him. Anti-Semitism was prevalent in Austria when Schoenberg lived there. It thrived during the Anschluss when it is estimated that Austrians were responsible for the deaths of some three million Jews and persisted in the post-war period both in popular sentiment and in politics. In 1947, the American Jewish Yearbook observed that, quote, of all the new regimes in the European countries, the Austrian government is the most anti-Semitic. In 1946, the Jewish organization in Vienna reported, quote, Vienna now as before is the center of the ugliest and most treacherous anti-Semitism and asserted that if it were not for the four occupying powers, not one of the Jews in this city would be able to appear in the streets. If the presence of the Allied occupiers after the war made the streets of Vienna safer for the Jews in that city, it did not change fundamental attitudes about them. Remember that Austria, like Germany, is divided among the Allies, and this lasted for 10 years, until 1955. So this is uh, divided Austria. Likewise, Vienna is divided and occupied as well for the decade. Um, that gray center, those of you who know Vienna, the first district in the middle apparently and their um, uh, great political occupying wisdom, the decision was made that whoever was in charge of the center district would rotate month to month. <laughs> so um, the people you needed to consult about anything happening in the, in the first district changed on a monthly basis. Um, the Allies made three decisions that helped anti-Semitism persist, however inadvertently. The first was the conferral of official first victim status. Already in 1943, the Declaration of the Four Nations on General Security signed in Moscow had identified Austria as Nazism's first victim. The post-war federal government was quick to promulgate the victim theory, emphasizing Austrian resistance and depicting National Socialism as a foreign tyranny. Official first victim status was broadly construed as granting absolution from all manner of wartime events, including Austria's own Nazism and its role in the Holocaust. And one unintended consequence was that it allowed anti-Semitism to flourish virtually unchecked during the occupation and beyond. 
The second was a denazification process that initially included the option of suspended sentencing for good behavior. Members that had never misused their membership and exhibited a positive attitude toward the independent republic. Um, you will not be surprised to know that about 90% of the party's 538,000 former members claimed this exemption. The third decision was requiring Austria to include a provision for political neutrality in the constitution of the Second Republic in 1955. Not only did this reinforce national perceptions of exceptionalism, but it also effectively took Austria out of the Cold War and off international radar, except when it had occasion to play the role of bridge between East and West. In essence, the Allies set up the punchline for the oft-repeated joke that Austria's two greatest accomplishments have been convincing the world that Hitler was German and Beethoven was Austrian. As in Berlin, post-war concerts were staged before the smoke had even cleared, and they were as much signs of a return to normalcy as symbols of resilience. The Red Army entered Austria in late March and secured the capital by early April. April 27th, the day on which Austria was officially severed from Germany, the city's flagship, flagship ensemble, the Philharmonic, gave a concert for invited political functionaries. For all its triumphant symbolism, however, one would never have known from the musicians amassed on stage that the Nazis had been defeated. The conductor Clemens Krauss was compromised by his work as an emissary of Third Reich's cultural politics, and 60 of the 123 musicians in the Philharmonic had been party members, two of them members of the SS. Half of those had joined before the Anschluss, so before you could think there was compelling reason. Compare that to the status of the Berlin Philharmonic at war's end. Of its 110 musicians, 20 were members of the party. The Vienna Philharmonic gave its first post-war concert on the 3rd of June, with Robert Fanta conducting Gustav Mahler's first symphony. Fanta had been forbidden to work under the Nuremberg Laws, and his return to the podium was symbolic as the repertoire he conducted. Mahler had not been heard in Vienna since 1938 and the return of his music was part of the city's rehabilitation project. These concerts serve public notice that Vienna's musical heritage had survived the Anschluss and the war, a purpose that might also have been served equally well by the music of Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, or Schubert, any of the other beloved masters of the Viennese tradition. But Mahler conveyed a more specific political message. His return was supposed to symbolize a new democratic Austria and vindication against the anti-modernist anti-Semitic agenda of the German Nazi regime. Austria's first victim status enabled the pretense that there had never been any homegrown opposition to Mahler rooted in anti-modernism or anti-Semitism. And unlike the music of Schoenberg's second Viennese school, Mahler's music was easily appropriated for the discourse of Austrian folk, folksiness that accompanied the nation's post-war reinvention of itself. In the midst of all this, Schoenberg did have a few Viennese advocates. The most influential of these uh, was an attorney turned arts administrator and editor named Egon Seefellner. Uh, immediately after the war, he became general secretary of the Austrian Cultural Union and was soon active in a wide range of cultural organizations. Generally speaking, he found the city's major institutions too high bound by Viennese tradition. Although he recognized that there was one homegrown tradition audiences were not rushing to invase, embrace, and that was Schoenberg's 12-tone Second Viennese School. He established the International Music Fest under the auspices of the Konzerthausgesellschaft in hopes of persuading non-specialist Viennese audiences to engage with modernism's international mainstream. After all, in the immediate post-war period, 12-tone method very nearly was the international mainstream. If Vienna was ever going to be relevant to the, to the new music scene again, he thought, it had to make amends with its native son, Schoenberg, and with his music. In December of 1947, Seefellner had asked Schoenberg for permission to grant any one of his works for the second International Music Festival, and Schoenberg had declined. He wrote, I have the impression that in Vienna, racial issues are still more important than artistic merit for judging an artwork. If, I, if, I, if it were otherwise, the need to cultivate my works after so many years of neglect would have emerged sooner, and not just at the second International Music Fest. Don't say that it would be better for me to forget the evil that has been done to me, end quote. So this then is the, concept, the context in which Scherchen asked Schoenberg to give his blessing to a performance of a survivor. 
Zeyfelner had already declared that the theme of the 1951 festival would be Schoenberg's second Viennese school, and that the major premiere would be a survivor from Warsaw. This announcement appeared in January before Schoenberg had agreed that that would even happen. Uh, this announcement notes that Schoenberg's circle is known worldwide and hails that year's series as the most comprehensive effect thus far in post-war Austria to demonstrate the global significance of Vienna to contemporary music. A performance of Mahler's Eighth Symphony, also conducted by Scherchen, was deemed the other major attraction of that festival, since it had not been played for 15 years in Vienna. The most distinctive feature of the Viennese performance of a survivor was surely the fact that the narration, originally in English, was recited in German translation. It says here that this is the premiere in, in the German language. The Konzerthausgesellschaft hired a retired diplomat and professional translator named Hans von Winter to produce a new version. Schoenberg found out about the translation after the fact. Uh, when Winter sent it to him and asked for his endorsement, he actually asked if he could help him get it published. Um, and Schoenberg, you know, his first reaction was like, who are you? And, um, and Winter says to him, oh, I was a member of the Society for Private Musical Performance back in the day. This was an organization that Schoenberg had run immediately after World War I in Vienna, which may or may not have been true. Uh, but at any rate, this is how he, he says he introduces himself to him. Unlike Schoenberg's original English text and its unidiomatic prose, Winter's Austrian version is lyrically poetic. The narrator would have to make substantial adjustments to the notated rhythms uh, to recite this text in performance, but it can be fitted to the general gestures and contours of the line. Winter adds adjectives, punctuation, and phrases for color. He uses proper and formal diction throughout. In other words, it's calibrated to sound like and be heard by educated native German speakers. Some of his choices are significant and go beyond the general elevation of language. He renders the end of the line, the old prayer they had neglected for so many years, the forgotten creed. Instead of forgotten creed, he says, ein vergessen Lied, a forgotten song, which is less weighty than the forgotten creed. Similarly, at the end of the narration and just before the chorus enters, he adds the text, Ihr altes Lied, their old song, before announcing the Schma. Most conspicuous is the omission of the word Gaskammer, or gas chamber, from the sergeant's final rant. Uh, in einer Minute will ich wissen, wie viele ich zur Gaskammer abliefere. In a minute, I want to know how many I am delivering to the gas chamber. Winter renders the second clause as simply, wie viele ich abliefere, how many I am delivering. This omission may have originated with Scherchen. The recording of the German premiere at Darmstadt in 1950, which he also conducted, reveals that the narrator there made a similar adjustment. Omitting an explicit reference to the Third Reich's distinctive method of mass execution makes the text less graphic by a degree and seems calculated to soften the impact on a German-speaking audience. In a plot twist that typifies the complicated reality of the post-war period in Central Europe, Venter, the translator, had been a member of the Nazi party. He joined in 1932 under the pseudonym Walter Hengauf, uh, which made him hard to find. <laughs> that was a, a lot of um, archival digging to turn him up. His, the biography he submitted with his application to the SS in June 1939 recounts his faithful service to the party from far-flung posts, including reports to the Viennese Gauleiter Alfred Frauenfeld from Moscow and Paris, Presumably that's the reason for the pseudonym, since the Austrian police were carefully monitoring known Nazis even before the party was outlawed in 1933, and close collaboration with the Gestapo branch in Turkey while stationed in Istanbul during the party's ban. The fact that a former Nazi is responsible for the German translation of a survivor used for the Austrian premiere, bizarre though it may seem now, is also typical of daily life in post-war Central Europe. It was hard to get anything done without working with a few former Nazis, rehabilitated or not. The reception afforded Schoenberg's remigration to Vienna via a survivor was much affected by the fact that the work of two other exiles had gotten there first. These were Mahler, as I've noted, and also Thomas Mann. Schoenberg became linked with them in a kind of Faustian constellation in post-war Viennese intellectual life, and this shaped his hometown reception. Like Schoenberg, Mann was a German-speaking immigre living in California who had become an American citizen, and his works had also been banned under the Reich. 
His 1947 novel, Dr. Faustus, ignited a firestorm of controversy in Germany over its portrayal of his, home, his former homeland's decline into barbarity. The novel was inflammatory for Schoenberg, too, because the composer, Adrian Leverkuhn, the anti-hero, was so obviously patterned after Schoenberg, and the portrait is not flattering. Uh, Leverkuhn trades his soul to the devil in exchange for 24 years of unparalleled 12-tone creativity before succumbing to syphilis-induced madness. All is an allegory for Germany's fate after having sold its soul to Hitler. Because Theodor Adorno had acted as Mann's musical informant, the descriptions of the compositional process have the ring of authenticity. And the composer worried that readers might think that Mann had actually invented dodecophony. I doubt there were a lot of people lining up to take credit for that, but um, he was worried that, that Mann might get that. He was also worried about his personal reputation. Um, Alex Ross starts a chapter in The Rest is Noise by recounting something that Marta Feuchtwanger recalled in an encounter with Schoenberg from the produce department in a supermarket in Los Angeles, where he apparently shouted over the cantaloupes, it's all lies, Frau Marta. You know I have never had syphilis. <laughs> so Mann's novel was known to the Viennese intelligentsia uh, and elsewhere by the time a survivor got to Vienna. The Faustian context binding Schoenberg to Mann also includes Mahler because Mahler's Eighth Symphony, which was also performed on this uh, concert festival, sets a text from Goethe's Faust. So all of these things end up triangulated in the press. The language used to identify the composer as well as the victims and perpetrators uh, that form the, the, the storyline of a survivor reveals much about the status of Jews, new music, and the allies in a divided, occupied city in which each faction is represented by its own media apparatus. The Wiener Courier, the newspaper of the US Army Group Press, was innovative and colorful and is generally considered the first Austrian tabloid. Its reviewer lauded, quote, the creative power of the old master of the Vienna School, who is highly respected in America, showing itself to be ignited anew and with shattering intensity in this portrayal of mass murder that was once a gruesome reality. Now, asserting that Schoenberg was valued in the United States burnished America's cultural credentials, while implying that the Viennese did not grant him sufficient respect. Furthermore, not only are his creative powers undiminished by advanced age or immersion in US culture, they are renewed and enriched. The reviewer praised the realistic portrayal of, re of recent history as being imbued with the ethical magnitude of this statement, which extends beyond the narrow range of survivor, describes the speaker's narration as an accusation that, quote, leads to the chorus mysticus of the doomed who sing together the Shema Israel. Naming the Shema identifies the victims, and if only by implication, the accused. The Chorus Mysticus is the link to Mahler, since uh, this is the conclusion from part two of Goethe's Faust that Mahler set in his Eighth Symphony, the other work Scherchen is conducting on the festival. The analogy, the analogy, an analogy to the Chorus Mysticus suggests that the critic was interpreting the Shema as a triumphant act in the face of death that will end this mortal life and bring transcendence. The American Wiener Courier came out at lunchtime. That evening, the Weltpresse of Wien, representing the Social Democratic Party of Austria, responded with a negative review that really goes through point by point refuting what the American press had written. Uh, in this case, this critic does demand, uh, does, um, uh, seems to have a, a decent working knowledge of the 12 tone compositional method, although he's wrong about some things, which was not unusual. In 1951, there was still no. 12 tone for dummies, there was no, nothing was circulating that really told people how to do this. And even advocates were frequently wrong. Uh, in this case, the critic says the method, uh, the 12 tone method is a misunderstanding and an abuse of the intervallic relationships of tonality. The author concedes that it may be just such a lifeless use of tones that is suitable for a work like a survivor. Lifeless is a term that was often applied to Schoenberg's music uh, during the period of the Third Reich, and this has this sort of um, echo of Nazi-era critiques of atonal music as degenerate and unnatural. The propagandistic nature of journalism, here we have um, him responding literally point by point to the United States, to realism and ethics. He says, of course this piece was probably only ever meant for Americans. 
for, it is, for us, it is just not possible to have a sergeant's commands included in the context of a work of art, no matter how high the ethical purpose that makes this realism necessary. Sabina Feist has debunked the pernicious European myths about the bad effects of American culture on Schoenberg's music. In this version, exp exposure to American Philistinism has impaired his judgment so that he no longer meets the high artistic standards of his Viennese roots. Such a remark also reflects disdain for the coca colonization agenda of the American occupiers, which included importing everything from Coca-Cola to American art music and pop culture. Style aside, however, asserting that a survivor was only meant for American audiences relieves the Viennese reader of any obligation to engage with the content, particularly the accusation identified by the first critic. Whether any ethical cause is lofty enough to warrant such realism in art is an age-old aesthetic debate, but in the context of 1951, this deflection is disingenuous, particularly as the author never identifies the cause in question. He never talks about the subject matter. He just refers to horror and fear. The most eloquent review was written by Kurt Blaukopf for Der Abend, a paper affiliated with the Communist Party, although not its official organ. Blaukopf was a Jewish communist and musicologist who left Vienna in 1938 and lived in Jerusalem from 1940 to 47. Upon his return to Vienna, he established the Institute for Music Sociology and became the leading Austrian figure in that field. His review of Survivor does not take the then standard communist position of dismissing it as formalist out of hand. He describes the function of music in a Survivor as akin to, quote, the pessimism of a neorealist film. Yet in the closing prayer, it shows an approach to overcoming dissonant ideology and ideological dissonance. Uh, his review is the most explicit about the subject matter. He describes it as a chronicle of the Jewish destiny in the Warsaw Ghetto, which then opens into the sincere prayer of the chorus. He also takes pains to explicitly distinguish Schoenberg from the character in Mann's novel. He says, this is not the revocation of the Ninth Symphony. It is not the repeal of Beethoven's classic work, as we had um, in the Ode to Sorrow uh, from uh, Dr. Faust. Rather, it is an attempt to rediscover the countenance of the people in the rubble, reconstructing harmony out of dissonance. This image would surely resonate with the Viennese rebuilding a war-torn, occupied city. And he describes um, Schoenberg's piece as countering or counteracting dissonance three times in a very short review. Dissonance is um, typically an adjective ascribed to Schoenberg's music. And I think the fact that he's trying to attribute to it instead these post-war virtues of overcoming and reconstructing is meant to um, try to help carve out a space for this repertoire. The critic for the Österreichische Volksstimme, the Communist Party's central organ, was less accommodating, reflecting that party's official role as Austrian mouthpiece for the Soviets. This critic, uh, Marcel Rubin, was a Jewish Viennese composer, had spent the war years in Mexico City working with the opera company there. He joined the Communist Party of Austria there in 1940 and returned to Vienna in 47 as a freelance um, composer and critic. He's explicit about the subject. He says it depicts a massacre in the Warsaw Ghetto and ends with an old Jewish prayer. He says that the horror of the roll call in the ghetto, the roar of the sergeant, are all powerfully rendered in film-like music. And he's not the only person to, this has been something, this is a, a description pro and con that has t uh, followed this piece from its very first performance. But, he says, Schoenberg does not express feelings in music as Beethoven would have done, end quote. Yet another way in which Schoenberg cannot measure up to his Viennese predecessors. He concludes that atonal music might be useful for conveying the fears of lonely individuals in bourgeois society, but atonality cannot be the music of the future post-capitalist world of peace and freedom. Three other papers had really short notices about this. Uh, the Wiener Tageszeitung was the central organ of the Austrian People's Party. Founded in 1945 to attract the bourgeois patriotic conservative vote. Here, the musicologist Roland Tenshirt found the Schma did not provide the comfort he was hoping for at the end of a survivor, although Verdi's sacred pieces did fill that role for him. Um, <laughs> this complaint need not be construed as anti Semitic, although this paper was not above that. It may simply reflect a personal aesthetic preference. Um, for the, or something for the familiar, be it musical or liturgical. 
The Neues Österreich represents the Grand Coalition of the Second Republic. This critic noted, uh, notes that it's an authentic report of a grisly event from the Second World War, which Schoenberg illustrates according to the uncompromising truth of his own style principles. Describing the use of the 12-tone method as uncompromising carries a whiff of the Ordonian and is a far cry from the language in the Weltpresse Wien in which it was described as lifeless. The final concert review is in Die Furche, a weekly cultural with strong Catholic leanings, where uh, the reviewer simply notes that um, Schoenberg illustrates the report of a survivor from Warsaw with dismally blazing colors, which is a difficult thing to envision. The Soviet paper, the Österreichische Zeitung, published a piece explaining it had boycotted the entire festival, because despite the title, it was not truly international, but rather cosmopolitan. <laughs> Soviet composers were snubbed, the repertoire was inaccessible to regular people, and the only bright spot was the reappearance of Mahler's Eighth. The concert was not covered in the two Jewish newspapers in Vienna, Die Stimme and Neue Welt und Judenstadt, which were understandably focused on political problems both at home and especially in Israel, where increasing tensions with Syria had escalated in the El Hama incident on 4th of April, 1951. Die Stimme did publish, as you see here, a commemoration um, on the eighth anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising. The 19th of April is the date of this publication. Of the published writings about this performance, only three use any version of the word Jew or Jewish when describing the subject matter. Two more signal Jewishness by naming the Shema, although how many readers would have recognized that Hebrew reference is debatable. Um, I think for most non-Jewish people living in Vienna, they associated um, Jews with Yiddish. They would not have ever had an occasion to hear Hebrew, so I'm not sure this would have resonated, this would have meant anything to them. This is significant because the title alone, A Survivor from Warsaw, would not have conveyed to those readers what it probably conveys to us. Central Europe in 1951 is full of survivors of one kind or another, and the word survivor did not yet have the Holocaust-specific connotations that have since accrued to it. Furthermore, everyone knew the Germans had destroyed the entire city of Warsaw, so there was no reason to assume a newspaper reader would know the reference to the ghetto without it being made explicit. What the program notes and all reviews have in common is a conspicuous silence. No one names the perpetrators. Even if readers don't need to be told, because everyone already knows the identity of the perpetrators, and it's safe to say they did, the code of silence is noteworthy. It participates in the maintenance of Australia's, of Australia, oh, absolutely, sorry, no, if there are Australians here, I apologize. Austria's first victim status in two ways. First, most authors deployed oblique allusions to Jewish victims when they identified them at all, a rhetorical device that helps to sustain the proprietary illusion of sole primary victimhood for Austrians. Yet Austrian Jews had certainly been among the victims in Poland. In October 1939, Jews in Austria and Czechoslovakia were deported to Poland. In late 1941, about 35,000 Austrian Jews were transported from Vienna to ghettos in the Soviet Union and Poland in 1942, Aktion Reinhardt affected thousands of foreign Jews, including Austrians in that region. Concentration Camp Warsaw received four transports of foreign Jews from Auschwitz after the, Warsaw, after the ghetto uprising, and Austrians were among them. Second, silence on the possibility of Austrian complicity in the Holocaust hid the equivocal past behind a facade of gemütlich national renewal. No critic acknowledged that those who perpetrated the events described in a survivor most certainly included Austrians, if not, in, if not in Warsaw, then surely elsewhere in Poland. No one named the Germans, possibly because the Austrians had been part of the Reich at that time. In each case, what remains unsaid is at least as important as what is made explicit. In some, it appears that Schoenberg's ambivalence about his symbolic remigration to Vienna in the form of a survivor was probably well-founded. Thank you. Thank you.